The Lord be with you. When I opened the news this morning, the first headline had the word chaos in the title. Does it ever feel like that? <laughs> that the world is spiraling into chaos? That society is falling apart? And not just society, but, but the church, which seems so often just to reflect the worst of the culture in which it exists. Some Christians in Egypt uh, thought this about 250 years after Christ. Uh, they were worried that the church was just reflecting the culture around it. Uh, they saw corruption. They saw secularization. And so uh, they decided... <laughs> to move into the desert. They wanted to discover or rediscover what the church was for. They wanted to know if the church could truly be light and salt in the world. They wanted to recover a community of holiness. And the Egyptian desert became their laboratory, a laboratory of the soul, a laboratory of Christian community. It was... Uh, an experiment. Um, one, of, one of those believers who went into the desert was St. Anthony. He's often considered the founder of monasticism as we know it. And Anthony said this, Our life and our death is with our neighbor. If we gain our neighbor, we have gained God. But if we cause our neighbor to stumble... We sin against Christ. St. Anthony and many of these desert dwellers had a lot to say about community, about being in relationship with others. And they said a lot, uh, a lot of the time, that we have this tendency to get in the way um, between God and others, to become obstacles uh, between others and God. Rowan Williams is an Anglican bishop, and he, he says this about the Desert Fathers. They knew one of the great temptations of being religious is to intrude between other people and God. We like to think that we know more about God than our neighbor, and we like to think that it's okay to control our neighbor and their access to God. You can actually read a great deal of the history of the church as a sustained attempt to police one another's relationships with God. The Desert Fathers didn't escape that by going to the desert. No, on the contrary, they were concerned to draw this out with greater and greater clarity, to encourage and to foster greater and greater honesty about how we get in other people's way before God. St. Paul was a pro at this. He had made a career of this as a young Pharisee. Listen to what he says in Acts 26. I believed that I should oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth, so I did everything I could to oppose his name. That's what I was doing in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. I agreed that they should die. I often went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. I tried to force them to speak evil things against Jesus. Force. Paul was an expert in using force to keep God's people holy, to keep Judaism pure from these Jesus followers corrupting the faith. until Jesus showed up on the road to Damascus and interrupted Paul's life of policing others' relationships with God. Paul's conversion to Christ was his crucifixion, his death, the death of his old way of being in the world, the death of his self-righteousness, his tendency uh, to get between others and God, the death of his fragile ego, the death of his 
controlling legalism. But Paul's conversion to Christ was also, also his resurrection, his new creation to a new way of being in the world made possible through Jesus Christ, a way of self-giving service, a way of doing good to everyone, a way of life that is made holy by grace, not through works. But we easily get caught and pulled into that old way of being. And this was happening among churches in Galatia. Some Jewish believers who had begun to follow Jesus were uh, bringing with them all of the laws, all of the practices of Judaism. And not only that, they insisted that Gentiles do the same. They insisted that Gentile men had to be circumcised if they wanted to follow Jesus as Messiah. And Paul knows from his old life of legalism that this is a death sentence to the good news. So he sends a letter to the churches of Galatia. And, and when Paul would send a letter, he would, he would dictate. He would speak out what he wanted the letter to say. Uh, and there was a scribe at a desk writing down what Paul was saying. And this is how um, the letter to the Galatians was written, presumably. Uh, until uh, the last eight verses. When Paul gets so worked up over what's going on around circumcision and legalism, the church, he, he shoves the scribe off his chair and says, give me that pen. And he writes in capital letters. He says, see what large letters I'm writing in. And then he says this. Some people are worried about how things look on the outside. They are trying to force you to be circumcised. Paul knows that the use of force has nothing to do with genuine faith. So why are people doing this? Paul says it's because they want to stay on good terms with their Jewish family and friends who don't follow Jesus. They don't want to give up this former life and all its practices and ways. They don't want to have to give that up to follow Jesus. So instead, they forced Gentile believers uh, to give up um, their way of life. Paul is, is so upset over what he sees as legalism and hypocrisy, this double standard that these men in power in the Galatian churches have such high expectations for others to change, uh, but they don't see... <laughs> they might have a need to change as well. We need to hold on a minute here. Because if, if you know something about Paul's story, uh, some, some red flags are being raised now. About a year before Paul sends this letter to the Galatian churches, he's on his second missionary journey, and he's traveling through Galatia. Um, and when he comes to Lystra, he he meets a young disciple named Timothy. Now, Timothy's mother is Jewish and his father's Greek. And following his father's custom and practice, Timothy is not circumcised when he's born. Acts 16.3 says this, Paul wanted to take Timothy along on this journey. So Paul circumcised Timothy because of the Jews who lived in that area. Hold on a second. <laughs> Wait a minute, Paul circumcised Timothy? Then a year later, sends this letter to the Galatian church is rebuking those requiring circumcision of others. Is Paul the real hypocrite? What's going on here? Well, I think we need to back up one more year um, when Paul is in Jerusalem for an important council meeting. And on their agenda is this question of circumcision for Gentile men. Is it necessary? And during the council, Peter, Barnabas, Paul, James, they all give testimony that the Holy Spirit has been poured out on Gentiles, that their faith in Jesus is true. And so the council decides not to require circumcision. Instead, they ask Gentiles 
to refrain from food, sacrifice to idols, uh, and to avoid sexual immorality. New Testament scholar Love Seacrest says this um, about the Jerusalem Council. She says that it decided three important things. First, that newcomers in the church should not be harmed. (laughs) There's this concern for the Gentile minority. At the time, the church is predominantly Jewish. So there's this care for the minority culture in the midst of the majority culture. The second thing the council decided was an approach of compromise. Neither side was entirely happy with the decision. (laughs) Many of the Jews wanted all of these practices. They wanted circumcision. So they didn't get everything they wanted. But the Gentiles had to accommodate as well. They they had to refrain from barbecues with their neighbors after uh, temple sacrifices. They had to accommodate. And third, um, the council affirmed unity, this pursuit of unity. And the compromise allowed a blended family of faith to grow up together and develop over time. So instead of having a a Jewish church over here with these practices and a Gentile church over here without certain practices, they sought to be one in Christ. So if we we understand Paul's circumcision of Timothy in this light, Paul's not trying to follow a law. Paul is actually trying to protect Timothy uh, from harm on this mission to the Galatian churches. Paul knows that Timothy will surely encounter the same powerful group of legalists who may run Timothy out of town. But if Timothy's circumcised, um, there's a way in. He has credibility to share the good news of Jesus. And circumcision for Timothy is also a way to honor his mother's identity. Timothy becomes more bicultural through circumcision. So in his body, he carries Jewish and Greek identities, which gives him this ability to code switch in a diverse church, an ability to relate to such different kinds of people, which is one thing the Holy Spirit is nurturing in the church. I mean, some of us in this room know what it's like to have to code switch every day moving from different spaces, um, what to say, how to speak, how to be. And sometimes that's, that's an act of survival. <laughs> but here, it's for the sake of the good news of Jesus and the possibility that the church can be a diverse community united in Christ. And I wonder in this season for our church, how can COS honor the diverse cultures in our church? How can we live according to the apostolic decree of Acts 15? How can we take great care that newcomers and cultural minorities are honored? How can we be open to compromise in order to build a blended family of God's people that might grow and develop over time? How can we continue to seek unity amidst our differences? Sadly, there were no Gentiles at the Jerusalem Council. They didn't have a voice at the table. And I wonder, I wonder how the conversation would have changed. How would the compromise have been different? I wonder how we might actually come closer to one another in our cultural differences, in our different convictions, uh, to be curious to be teachable, to be learners, to be humble, instead of judging (laughs) from a distance. And this moves us from control to the cross. I said Paul's past was marked by control, by this willingness to force others into uh, his expectations. But Paul's new life in Christ was now marked by the cross. And Paul has become so sold out for Jesus and the message of the cross that he's willing uh, 
to make compromises, and compromises that might surprise us and might leave us all unhappy in some way. And he says this is for the sake of new creation. And new creation doesn't come through policing other people's relationship with God, according to our interpretation of the rules. New creation comes through the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ alone, who is at work in us. And once we've been crucified with Christ, which we witness in baptism and remembered today, we can say this with Paul from 1 Corinthians 9. I am free and don't belong to anyone. But... I have made myself a slave to everyone. I do it to win as many to Christ as I can. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. That was to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one who was under the law. I did this even though I myself was not under the law. To those who don't have the law, I become like one who doesn't have the law. I did this even though I'm not free from God's law. I'm under Christ's law. Now I can win those who don't have the law. To those who are weak, I became weak. That was to win the weak. I have become all things to all people. I have done this so that in all possible ways I might save some. I do this because of the good news. And I want to share in its blessings. Does that make Paul a relativist, a flip-flopper, an opportunist, doing whatever, whenever? Some might say so. But maybe, maybe the cross of Christ makes Paul ready and willing to sacrifice his comfort and his preferences so that others might know Jesus, so that he doesn't become an obstacle So he doesn't get in the way of other people's relationship with God and the possibility of faith in Jesus. Paul says just after our reading in Galatians 6.17, I bear in my body the marks of Christ, which is likely from persecution, from being run out of town, from being stoned. And so Paul's new life of freedom in a way becomes Uh, more constrained, more cruciform, more disciplined, more rigorous, more sacrificial. While at the same time, Paul's posture toward others becomes more gentle, more open, more accommodating, more flexible. Unless you're someone with power trying to force (laughs) obligations on others, then Paul has some words, as we heard today. Jesus had words for such folks. Are we like those in power in Galatia, holding others to a very high bar for their behavior, willing to police their relationship with God, while so easily we give ourselves cheap grace and rationalize our behavior? But the cross calls us to a different way, friends. Instead of focusing our time and energy to control the behavior of others, the cross calls us to pour ourselves out in prayer, in fasting, in study, in deep listening, in sacrificial service, in self-examination, in confession. That's the church I want to be a part of. I've mentioned the word force a few times. Jesus uses this word in Greek once. It's in the parable of the great banquet, which is about God's invitation to the kingdom. Uh, When the time comes for this great banquet, um, the master sends out servant to, to gather in the people that have been invited. And one after another, they say, well, I'm busy with this. I've got family obligations, I'm busy with my work, I got to tend to this at home. And the servant comes back and the master says, well, go out, go out into the streets 
go out into the country roads and force people to come in. Force people to come in. I want my house to be full. I tell you, not one of those people who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. The one time Jesus talks about force, it's to get outsiders into the kingdom of God. It's to make outsiders feel at home in the house of the Lord. It seems that Jesus cares most about having a full house. So until that banquet day, until that harvest, may we not become tired of doing good. At the right time, we will reap a kingdom crop if we do not give up. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.